Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Bayless Conley. Hallo en welkom bij de broadcast. Today we have something really special for you. Our son Harrison is actually bringing the word today. And uh, listen, he's a fine preacher. He's going to be talking about the real kind of joy, lasting joy. How do you have a joy that comes from deep within and that is not fleeting? Well, he addresses those things in a very, very practical way. Listen, I'm telling you, you are going to love this. I want to take a few minutes and um, I want to talk about what I feel is the most important topic in all the world. I want to talk about Jesus. And uh, some people go, why is this guy always so excited about Jesus? I'm excited about Jesus because I don't believe he's just a guy. Um, I don't believe he's just a man. I believe he's the God man. And I believe that one encounter with him can literally change the course and the trajectory of our lives. And so I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about community. And I want to talk about joy. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and find 1 John chapter 1. And as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context. And then as well, let me tie us into the story. Let me give you some continuity as well. But let's start with context. So at the time of his writing, John, by the way, this is 1 John. No surprise, it's written by John. Uh, John the Beloved, John, one of the disciples. At the time of his writing, he, he's up in age. He's near the end of his life. Um, he's writing this some 60 years after the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of of Jesus, and John is writing from a place of unique firsthand personal experience, um, having spent the majority of his adult life processing and unpacking his friendship and his relationship with Jesus. Many scholars believe John to have been the best friend of Jesus, and one of the byproducts of being up in age and having this personal firsthand experience is that John, he, he uses a very unique writing style. You will find that John is very direct in his writing. He, he doesn't pull any, any punches. He gets to the point very quickly. John is a straight shooter. He writes in black and white. Um, he is not very diplomatic in his writing. Um, his writing style uh, at times feels like you're having a conversation with a grandparent. I remember at one point I had a conversation with my grandpa. I was having this relational trouble with, with a, a certain someone, and I came to him asking for some advice. Um, you ever have that relationship or that that? Uh, conversation with a grandparent, they don't pull any punches. I remember my grandpa saying, look, don't be stupid. Just cut that relationship off. End of story, right? There was no sympathy. There was no compassion. There was like, listen, I, I've lived a lot of life and, and I'm not going to paint life to be something that it's not. Um, let me just tell you how it is. That's how John writes. He refers to himself as the elder, um, translated old man. He refers to himself as old man John, and that's in the most affirmative and affectionate um, you know, reverent way of doing that. It's not a derogatory term, but old man John, in these letters, he, he doesn't waste any time getting to the point. Uh, he uses a very limited vocabulary. At times, his words are very repetitive. Um, in the first four sentences or the first four verses that we'll cover tonight in the original language, they're one long, unbroken, repetitive sentence. It's almost like John saying, look, I'm going to tell you what's up. I'm going to give you the truth of the matter. I'm going to talk to you about Jesus, about life, about spirituality, and I'm going to be direct. But know that I'm saying it in honesty, and I'm saying it in love. At the time of John's writing, scholars believe that he was living in a city called Ephesus, and that he's writing to a multiplicity of Christ communities, a multiplicity of churches that are spread out across Asia Minor. And the reason for John's writing, the reason he's going to be very direct and very straightforward in his word choice is because reports and rumors had come back to him that these churches across Asia Minor had begun to complain and argue, saying that the message of Jesus, it's just not enough anymore. It's just not cutting it anymore. They, they would say, we, we need more. The message of Jesus is it's sort of old and boring and old hat and outdated, and we've heard it enough. We're ready for the more. We need more spiritual realities. We, we need more truth. We need more light. We, we need more knowledge. So John, give us the deeper things of the scripture. Give us the meat and the potatoes of the scripture. Jesus just isn't enough. We need, we want, we desire more. And John writes these three letters, first, second, and third John. They're little sermonettes. He writes in response to this. The intent of these letters, it's for them to be read aloud in front of the congregation. 
broken down, made simple, and then to be applied in their lives. And this is this part of continuity where we actually come in contact with the scriptures. I want you to see John's original intent for writing these letters. So John would write this letter. It'd be sent to the pastor of that church. The pastor would get up in front of the congregation, read the letter or read a portion of the letter, do his best to simplify it, make it understandable, make it applicable. He would teach it. Then it would end in a time of prayer and then a time of singing. And then they would dismiss the service. I love that because that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. Please understand these letters and the words that we're going to read this morning. Uh, they're just as relevant today as they were when they were first written. They still apply. They are still living and breathing and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's exciting to think that we play a part in what God is doing in the earth. So now understanding the context of the letter, understanding the continuity that we're connected to it, let, let's read 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1. I'm reading out the New Living Translation. If you don't have that, you can just follow along on the screen. Verse 1, John says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we've heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes, and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one, who is life itself, was revealed to us, and we've seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Verse 4, the New King James says it like this, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. The English Standard Version says that your joy may be complete. John writes about three main themes, Jesus, community, and joy. It's almost as if he sets a pattern or a progression out in front of us. They're not separated from each other. They're not divorced from each other. They, they need each other. They're intertwined. It's almost this, this mathematical equation, Jesus plus community equals joy. But John starts with Jesus. Old man John, he wastes no time in addressing the most important topic of all. Jesus. And I know we touched on this a moment ago, but we have to understand at the time of John's writing, there was a pervading and a, a pervasive, uh, perverting thought, a, a heresy of the day that had made its way into the church. And it was this idea called Gnosticism. It's still around today. And the idea is that salvation does not come through Jesus. It acknowledges that Jesus was a man and that Jesus was a good man, but that's all that he was. He was not divine and he was not God. His teachings, yeah, they're on par and they can be emulated, but true salvation, it was only for a select few, and those select few got salvation by attaining a, a deeper level and a higher level of esoteric spiritual knowledge. Now, these Gnostics, they began to infiltrate these churches, these Christ-centered communities uh, around Asia Minor, and they'd begun to, to poison the well, as it were. They began to be that, that rotten apple that spoils the bunch, they, they began to come in and proclaim that the message of Jesus, it just wasn't enough anymore. They, they would come into these communities and they begin to whisper that you need more. You need a higher knowledge. You, you need a, a deeper, more spiritual reality. You need to chase after supernatural happenings. Jesus just isn't enough. His lessons, yeah, they're fine, they're great, but they're too simple. You need the deeper things of the word. You need the deeper knowledge and understanding of the universe and spiritual realms. Like I said, Gnosticism wasn't just an issue 2,000 years ago. It finds its way into the church even today. And old man John, in his opening line, he tackles this thing head on, this idea about Jesus being divine. Look at verse 1. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. What's John doing? He's declaring from the outset that Jesus and the eternal God, the one that existed from the beginning, they're one and they're the same. That Jesus is God, that Jesus is divine. He leaves no room for misinterpretation. John is saying Jesus is the highest power. He's the highest reality. He is the highest knowledge in all of the universe. He says, whom we've seen and whom we've heard. He said, we saw him with our own eyes. We, we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of of life. I, I love this. John is not describing a what. He's describing a who. 
He's describing a person. He's declaring a person, not a doctrine, not a philosophy, not a school of thought that leads to knowledge. He declares a person, a person named Jesus. And if I were to try and encapsulate into a phrase all that John is trying to sum up in these first few verses, all that he's trying to communicate about Jesus, I would say it like this. John is trying to say to us, Jesus is always more. Now, I know that's a phrase you've heard me say before. You know where I got that from? From reading 1 John. Jesus is always more. When you think you've seen it all, when you think you know it all, when you think you've experienced it all, (laughs) John would say, you're just getting started. Jesus is always more. You think you need more knowledge? You think you need more spiritual reality? You think you need more truth? No, you need Jesus. Jesus is always more. John is clearly letting us know, he's letting his readers know that there is no other message, there is no other truth, that Jesus all by himself is more than enough, that that you can study him and you can stare at him and you can know him and you can experience him. And the longer you do those things, the more you then begin to realize you can spend your whole life and then spend all of eternity and still never see all that Jesus is because Jesus is still always more. John is saying, look, I'm not making this up. John is going, look, this is not hyperbole. This is not preacher talk here. I know this from experience because I saw him. I walked with him. I touched him. I heard him teach the multitudes. I I heard him pray in the garden of Gethsemane. I watched him take a kid's lunch and feed 5,000 people. I watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. I was there in the boat when Jesus spoke to the elements. He spoke to the wind and the waves, and they obeyed him. I was there at his transfiguration. I was there at his crucifixion. I walked into his tomb, and I saw with my own eyes that he wasn't there and that he was raised to life. As a matter of fact, I saw him post-resurrection. I had breakfast on the beach with him. I touched the holes in his hands and his feet and his side. I was there on the Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. I was there on Pentecost when he poured out his Holy Spirit. John goes, look, don't tell me you need more. Don't tell me you need to experience more because I've seen it and I've touched it and I've heard it and I know it to be true. I've spent my whole life focused on this and at the end of the day, I'm communicating to you that Jesus is is more that he's more all by himself that there is nothing you can add on to him as a matter of fact in the first three verses John uses five different descriptive terms to describe the different aspects different nuances of you if you will of the more of who Jesus is verse one he calls him the one who existed from the beginning then he calls him the word of life Then he calls him the word made flesh, the word manifested, all talking about Jesus. Verse two, he calls him eternal life. Verse three, he calls him the son of God. It's as if John is saying, look, I've spent the last 60 years of my life reflecting on my relationship, reflecting on my encounters and my friendship with Jesus. And and, and there's just some things that I've discovered about him. I mean, you keep reading throughout 1 John. He doesn't stop. The list continues to grow. He can't stop talking about the more of who Jesus is. He calls Jesus the Christ. 37 times in 1 John. He calls him the Son of God 28 more times in 1 John. He calls him our abiding place 16 times. He calls him Savior 13 times. He calls him light or true light seven times. He calls him eternal life six more times. He calls him God in the flesh four more times. And that's just to name a few because the list goes on and on. He calls him advocate and propitiation, the, the destroyer of the works of the darkness. He calls him the soon and coming one. The point being that when we think we've seen it all or heard it all or experienced it all, when we think we have exhausted all of who Jesus is, John's saying, no, you're just going to turn the corner and you're going to realize you've just begun. You've just begun to scratch the surface of who Jesus is. You've got a lifetime. You've got all of eternity of discovery ahead of you. Then we jump into verse three and John goes back to work, adding an additional layer to this initial theme. He now shifts the focus to the idea of community. Now remember, these themes, they're progressive. They're intertwined. They build upon each other. So when he starts talking about community, he's not talking about it as an isolated thing. He's talking about it in the term of a Christ-centered community, that we discover the more about Jesus together. John would say we're better together. Look at verse 3. He says, we proclaim to you, what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. He's talking about Jesus. We proclaim to you what we've seen and what we've heard so that, those two words are important. There's a reason. 
The reason I'm telling you about Jesus is so that you may have fellowship, friendship, or community with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I love this because you get the picture. John's going like, look, hey, we're in diverse places. We're diverse people. I'm here in Ephesus. You're, you're over there somewhere in the province of Asia Minor. I'm old in the faith. You're young in the faith. I may not know you personally. I may not know you by name. I may have never even seen your face. But yet, if you believe in Jesus to be Savior, we have this common bond. And that common bond, it unites us. And because of that, because of Jesus, we can partake in and we can participate and we can share in sweet fellowship together. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about our Savior Jesus. Is that Jesus brings diverse groups of people together people that are racially diverse, people that are politically diverse, people that are geographically separated, people that come from different places, different backgrounds, different worldviews, different ideologies, people that are of different ages, different generations, different personalities, different giftings, different interests, different hobbies. All these diverse groups of people can come together and be one because of Jesus. And if you don't believe that to be true, look around this room today. This is the antithesis of a homogenous group. We're equal parts black, white, Asian, and Hispanic. I love this. This is a picture of heaven. And it's not just people that come from Southern California. We've got different cities represented here, but people come from all over the states. Watching online right now, we have all these different states and all these different countries around the world. How is that possible? This diverse group of people with different giftings, different personalities, different backgrounds. They come from different places. They look different. They sound different. How can they all come together and have fellowship? Because they share a common bond. Jesus. And John says, that's why I write to you. I'm declaring to you what I know about Jesus. Because if you believe in Jesus, we can have fellowship together too. That word fellowship in the Greek is the word koinonia. Many of you will be familiar with that. It literally means the sharing of a common bond. It's Jesus. And I love the language that John uses. He's getting the picture across. He says, we are declaring to you what we have seen and what we have heard. John could have said, I'm declaring to you what I've seen and what I've heard. But he says, we. Who's we, John? Well, he's referring to the other disciples. He's referring to the community of believers that are there with him at Ephesus. He's basically saying, look, we as a Christ-centered community, we're declaring the thing that we've seen and we've heard, that we've experienced with you. We're declaring it to you so that you can be in community with us too, so that we can share fellowship with you because we want to grow in our understanding. We want to grow in our comprehension of the more of who Jesus is together with you. John goes, look, we're writing about what we know but we need to hear what you know because we realize not one group or one person sees the full picture. And that when we get together in community, that's when growth happens. That's when maturity takes place. We see more of Jesus together than we do alone. And then John ends this thought about community by saying something that should take our breath away. Something that would have taken the breath away of his readers. He says, truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus. Our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. Not was, but it is. Now, remember, at the time of John's writing, this is 60 years after Jesus has ascended into heaven. And John's readers know that it is no longer physically possible for him to touch, to hear, and to see Jesus. Yet John writes with this authority. John writes with this understanding like he's not lost his fellowship. Think about that. John is letting us know that we can have a personal relationship with the living God. That our understanding and our relating with Jesus doesn't have to just be us seeing him as Savior but that Jesus actually wants to be our friend, that he wants to be present with us now. That we've been invited into this amazing relationship of having shared life with the Father and with his son, Jesus. It's as if John is saying, look, the Father and the Son, they got together and they said, hey, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're gonna allow these different groups of people to come together and be in relationship with us. We're gonna let them in on our relationship of love. And John's letting us know that the way we discover and the way we grow in our understanding of all of who Jesus is, is by being plugged into fellowship or being plugged into community with other believers. 
And that's why I'm such a huge proponent of being in church. Listen, I know we live in the day and the age where you can pull up on your phone any church service that you want at any day during the week. But listen, I'm a huge proponent. I will always be a huge proponent of being in church, but in seat on a Sunday morning. You know why? Because the Bible says not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. The thing is this, you will not be who God's called you to be. You will not be as effective as God has called you to be unless you're in community. You need me, I need you. And as we bring our gifts to the table, growth comes to the body. That's what the Bible says. We need each other. And then John ends this opening statement by expressing what results when you put knowing Jesus together with being in community. It's our biblical, mathematical algebraic equation, A plus B equals C. John would say Jesus plus Christ-centered community equals joy. But not just any kind of joy. John would say it results in complete joy or full joy. Verse 4 of the New King James, in these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And John is talking about a joy that goes beyond an emotion, that goes beyond a feeling. When he says joy, he's not speaking of happiness. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness is a byproduct of of joy, but John's speaking about something greater. He's speaking about something, something deeper. This is a joy that's not based in circumstance. This is a, a joy that's not based in a good season or a bad season, but rather something that is founded and constantly fortified in knowing and experiencing Jesus. If I were to read into it, John is saying this. This is what full joy is. This is what complete joy is. Being able to recognize God's hand of love upon your life no matter the season. That when the doctor's report comes back in a negative fashion, we're able to go, hey, I don't understand it. I don't get it. But yet I recognize God's hand is on my life. And that whatever's going on in this season, I know his plans and his purposes for me are are for good. And God's using this season to set me up for the next season. And that God's plan is always to take me from grace to grace and from strength to strength and from glory to glory. That's what, what joy is. It's an inexhaustible hope on the inside that God is in control, that God's hand of love is upon us, that he looks at us through eyes of love and that his plans and his purposes for us are always and forever good. John says that's what results when you add Jesus in Christ-centered community. You have a, a joy, a joy that's a product of abiding in the love and in the presence of Jesus, having a personal relationship with him and having a personal relationship with other believers like him that are filled with the same Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said it like this in John 15 and Verse number nine and verse number 11, verse nine, Jesus said, as the father loved me, I also have loved you. And then he gives a command. He says, abide in my love. Abide, live here, dwell here, operate from this place, from my love. Well, Jesus, why should I do that? Verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. That my joy, not earthly joy, not human joy, not a joy that's based in circumstance, not a joy that only comes when you're on the mountaintop moments of life, not a joy that comes when when the bank account's full. My joy, a joy that persists when you're in the valley of the shadow of death moments, that joy that exists when you're one step away from being homeless, that that joy, that my joy, an unworldly joy, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy as a byproduct then will be full. So so here's the question I want to leave us with. How's your joy? Is it full? Is it complete? Is the greatest pursuit of your life to know Jesus and to discover the more of who he is? And I hope so. I hope so because nothing else in this world will satisfy. Nothing else in this world will result in your joy being full. Well, I know that you were blessed by the message that you just heard. And you know, there's another way that that I like to put joy, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and 
you. We can't really have a deep abiding joy unless we have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And the good news is it's, it's not about regulations, it's not about rules, it's not about religion, it is about relationship. That's why Jesus came, that's why he died on the cross, to bring us into a relationship with God after having paid for our sins. And now the way into a relationship with God is open if you'll open your heart to the Savior and say yes to Jesus. The Bible says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Confess Him with your mouth as Lord, and you will be saved. That is, God brings you into this relationship, brings you into His family. Call on the name of Jesus today. Just pray from your heart, Jesus, come into my life. I believe in you. Heb je een uitzending van Belis Comedy gemist? Op zijn website kun je op elk moment alle preken online terugkijken. Ga naar belen-comli.nl slash mediatheek. Hi there. We have a daily email devotional that I believe can be of great benefit to you. You know, when we take God's Word in every day, it helps us become established in the Lord. The Bible talks about the inward man being renewed day by day. Jesus had to take up our cross daily and to follow Him. Lees de overdenking op je smartphone, s ochtends bij de koffie, wanneer je onderweg bent, of meteen op je computer. Take time to sow the seeds of God's Word into your life every day with this free email devotional. Bedankt voor het kijken naar Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Ga naar belis-conley.nl voor meer informatie en inspiratie. If you don't have a copy of my daily devotional, Answers for Each Day, I'd like to encourage you to get one. It's a way to help discipline yourself to get some of the Word of God into your heart every day. And you know the scripture says that the inward man is renewed day by day. Jesus said man doesn't live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So you can get your daily spiritual bread, at least part of it, by reading that daily devotional every morning or every night. I give some thoughts, we share a bit on, on different scriptures and, and principles from the Bible. It'll be a blessing to you. Antwoorden voor elke dag. Bied je toegankelijke Bijbelse overdenkingen voor elke dag van het jaar. Maak er een gewoonte van om dagelijks deze Bijbelse waarheden te bestuderen samen met Belis. Je zult zien dat je geloof en je leven van binnenuit opgebouwd wordt. Bestel het dagboek nu. De gegevens staan in beeld. En ontdek antwoorden voor elke dag.